Thanks. Um, so, hope you enjoyed your lunch. I've got the the slot where everyone is in the post-food coma, so I'm going to try and uh, move around a bit to keep you awake. Um, I started uh, professionally in 1993 uh, 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 as a sport and exercise scientist, and I, I used music working with the, the British Olympic squads leading up to Sydney 2000, using music for motivation, goal setting, self-confidence, um, and at the same time, I started working for a hotel chain to develop a leisure and fitness brand, which we rolled out um, across 12, 12 hotels. Um, that company was then sold for 180 million pounds, but I had no shares. Oh, that's how I learned about business. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, hotels are, are special places, and I've got a lot of fantastic memories about the people that I met in, in the hotels while I was working there back in the 90s. So in 2003, I set up my company called Founding Music, and it was all about connecting uh, with client brands and businesses and organizations and saying, you should be using music and coming up with ideas of how they could use music within their businesses, whether it was to reach audiences, create new customers, create new products that they could sell to customers, or using it within their workforces for well-being, uh, health, and a whole host of other opportunities. This is an example, one of the first events that we did. Uh, it was called the Britbus Tour, and it was inspired by a report that was published by the BPI called Make or Break. Um, when Tom was saying about you know publishing reports to, in the hope that people will read it and look at the data and the information, and uh, other things will come from that. And so in this report, it said that um, British music in America had plummeted from 30% market share in the glory decades uh, down to 2%, and um, British music was struggling. And it was just around the uh, time of the 40th anniversary of the Beatles in America and the British invasion. So I said, right, let's do a British invasion tour. And I found uh, a double-decker bus after much searching across America. Uh, I found a bus that had four wheels and an engine and uh, all, its, all its windows intact and pimped it out and did the first tour in 2005, working with Visit Britain, Vig uh, Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Megastores, all the British brands, gathered them together, uh, took some uh, upcoming talent from, from the UK, and we went to cities and towns and encouraged people to come on board and have a British experience in there. I had a little oak bar here with Boddington's and Bass Ale on tap. Uh, we had plasma screens at the back, which were rolling, scrolling videos of, of um, also bigger artists that were releasing music at that time. Um, and Cadbury's very kindly sent me a huge stock of chocolate to give out across the tour, uh, which was a brilliant idea until we got to Phoenix, where it was 105 degrees, and the whole lot melted all over the bloody bus. It was everywhere. Uh, so we had to give all of the chocolate to the people of Phoenix and drove off. So uh, that sort of was my first encounter with, with tourism brands and promoting a destination. This is another example we did uh, a couple of years ago with the Greece Tourism Board. And um, so this is Matala Beach, Matala Village in southern Crete. Behind here is a cliff, and it's got lots of different, uh, lots of caves in it. And in the, in the early 70s, the 60s and 70s actually, it was on the hippie trail, and young travelers soon realized that they could just basically live in these caves. And it, become, it became known as a destination, you know, so that there, it was like a hotel of travelers in this cave. And Joni Mitchell was one of those travelers, uh, one of those travelers. and uh, her blue album was largely inspired by her travels. And if you listen to the song Carey on that album, it's all about Matala Beach and her experiences living in the cave, the people she met, going to the Mermaid Cafe on the beach. So, um, 
this event, uh, which we helped them develop, was based on celebrating the music of the 1970s with tribute bands and uh, lots of themed stuff. Uh, 25,000 people turned up at these um, festivals. And it happened, uh, it keeps happening now, it's called the Matala Beach Festival, it's amazing. And the local economy makes more money around that festival than they do the entire season. But they're finding now that the PR that it's generating also has put them on the map as a destination. So for the people of this village and the surrounding area in Crete, that is a, a big deal because they are struggling and there's huge unemployment problems uh, around, around that region. Um, a little close to home, we started working with Visit Kent and uh, Margate in particular, Visit Margate, because uh, there was a big riot between the mods and the rockers um, back in the day. And they had an annual event that went there from the Ace Cafe, which was becoming bigger and bigger and bigger that the Ace Cafe ran, because they went from the, the Ace Cafe in London and did a ride out, which they still do, every uh, every Easter to Margate. And they've been doing that for 75 years. So I was like, where are the mods? So they started trying to engage scooter clubs. And uh, so now you get just as many mods going as you do rockers. We haven't yet had another riot, but you never know. There's still time. So. Um, I spent six years doing a PhD part-time alongside our work because I became fascinated in these music anniversaries and um, taste and how music that we experience during youth uh, has a very deep emotional connec connection with us. This is one of the charts. Um, initially, I analyzed 20 years of music sales data that the BPI publishes every year. And certain trends started to come through. So without going into detail, because we don't have time, um, but I'm sure after a few beers tonight, you won't be able to stop me talking about it, because I am the PhD research project bore once I get going on this subject. But here's how much rock pop um, a typical 50-year-old was buying 50 years ago. And 20 years later, a typical 50-year-old seems to be a different person. And if you look at the over 50s brands like Saga in the UK, which are one of our clients, the AARP in America, which is the, um, the uh, Association of American Retired People, not the catchiest of titles, but they've got 38 million members that spend a lot of money. And they struggle to appeal to, to the new 50-year-old because the new 50-year-old sees those brands as their parents' brands, not their brands. They're seen as old age brands. Today's 50-year-old doesn't think they're old because they're not. They grew up with rock and uh, the baby boomers and Generation X are very different people who've experienced you know, the, the one of the most exciting periods in, in popular culture, which may never be seen again, the whole explosion of music from the mid 50s through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s um, in particular. So if you look at the market, uh, population graphs have traditionally looked like this. So they're bigger at the bottom and then people die. So you have less people at the top and um, this starts to change. So this is uh, the UK comparing the 2001, which is the black line, to 2011. And you can see these people starting to move up. And already, it's not looking such a pyramid. And within some of our lifetimes, um, we may see it uh, change into a rectangle. So this is, um, you know, this is a big topic for a lot of um, a lot of countries and a lot of sectors within the country. In particular, uh, the pension system, how the pension uh, system originally uh, worked was that you had a lot of people at the bottom paying for just a small amount of people at the top who would retire and then die very quickly. Um, well. Modern medicine has extended life expectancy and the birth rate has been declining. And so things like that and the National Health Service, which um, again was, was 
was developed when populations were very different, are going to have uh, serious <coughs> problems. Whoa. There's our hopes and dreams of retirement disappearing uh, into oblivion. But it's not all doom and gloom, because uh, this does also offer commercial opportunities because you've got a lot of people uh, who are who have disposable income who are going to be living longer than ever and the um, the population chart uh, sorry the the music taste chart that I showed you the music that we grow up with seems to have uh, a, a sort of a, a lifelong effect so that gives us opportunities this is from the AARP and 99% of over 50s are expecting next year to take one leisure trip. But the average is over five. So that's quite a lot of people. And even if you just look at the AARP, which is uh, 38 million members aged over 50, that's a lot of people. 51% are expected to travel within the USA. 43% will also travel internationally. Thanks to our plummeting pound, the UK, which always has been a popular destination for Americans, is becoming uh, even more attractive and affordable. And bucket lists are uh, a sort of a buzzword. So how do we look at that um, from a commercial point of view? And this is um, my country retreat. Uh, Thorsbury Hall in Nottinghamshire, it's not really, it's uh, Warner Hotels, one of our clients. And they wanted to know how they could use music. They already use music, but they wanted to know how they could use music to reach the younger demographics because they've got a very loyal, um, uh, very loyal database of uh, traditionally over 50s, but because they've been going to the to the to the hotels now for 20 years, they're over 70s. So we started looking at how to use music themes to segment different audiences. So if the music from our youth has a lifelong effect, that means you have music generations and you can segment audiences and think, right, so if you were born at this time, what did you grow up with? How can we create some kind of themed experience that taps into your emotional connection? So we looked at uh, music quizzes and Radio 2, because Radio 2 has an average age of 55. And Ken Bruce does Popmaster quiz on uh, uh, Monday to Friday mornings, hugely popular. So we partnered with Radio 2 and Ken Bruce, and we said, right, let's take Popmaster out on the road. And so we're going to be doing Popmaster quizzes out with Ken Bruce um, at these hotels um, from next year. We also looked at themed talks, experiences. So we've got several events happening um, throughout 2017, and we're booking into 2018 already, to look at how we can say, right, we'll have a Q&A. &A. We've got David Bowie's official tour photographer coming for a talk. We're going to look at all of the images, and he's going to talk us through the images uh, and his experiences going around the world with Bowie. And his biographer, we're going to say, right, you, you've got um, a new book out at the moment called Hero, which has just been listed in the b best um, biographies for Christmas, if you're looking for present ideas. It's called Hero by Leslie Ann Jones. And Leslie Ann will be coming along, and we'll be talking about her experiences. Um, she was the leading uh, music journalist on Fleet Street throughout the 80s. And um, so she's got some really interesting insights into Queen, The Who, Rolling Stones. And these kind of Q&As are really interesting. And they don't have to be with celebrities, which is what we found. And that is brilliant news, because featured names come with featured price tags. So if we don't need to have um, the Rolling Stones at this event, we can just do experts or um, people who work with the stones or people who can give really fascinating insights into it and then couple that with a you know some kind of vinyl rolling stones dj night or a, a really high quality uh, tribute band then that's an interesting package that we can roll out across the hotel chain 
And um, so then we thought, right, how can we also uh, feed new talent to these audiences? Because it's not all about uh, the music. I'm only interested in the music I grew up with because that isn't the case. I found uh, years of interviews, surveys, ethnographic, observational stuff that the new um, audience of 40 plus in, in particular, 30 plus, you know, rock, the rock pop styles are recycling. So there's very little difference between, I always use this example because um, my mum springs to mind with this. You know, you've got Shirley Bassey doing the James Bond theme tune, Adele doing the James Bond theme tune, classic singer-songwriter styles that have been recycling for decades and will continue to do so. She's got Adele's album. She's got Ed Sheeran's album. You know, there's not that they don't promote these to her. She's 70. They don't promote these albums to her, but t she likes it because it's a classic style that's been recycling, and. Older audiences do enjoy discovering new talent, but it's not promoted to them. So the music venues do not promote to the local 40 plus audience. Everyone, and brands in particular are guilty of this, obsessed with the millennials. It's all about the millennials this, the millennials that. The millennials are not spending as much money as the Generation X and baby boomer audience. They're traveling, they've got a passion for money, a passion for money, a passion for music, um, and they have money. That's what you want. So it's about getting creative. And I said to uh, the hotels, look, you, you, you have incredible uh, occupancy rates. It really is mind boggling how Warner Hotels with their audience that's now aged sort of 65 plus, is so loyal that they just repeat visit every year, every year, every year, every year. But they don't have 100% occupancy, so even when they've, you know, they're, they're doing really well, they've got 90% occupancy, that still means that there's at least one bedroom that isn't full. So I said, right, why don't we start putting in early uh, slots in the night where You've got 20 locations around the UK, around England, and we can start putting a tour together so that an artist can come and do an opening slot for you on this night. You've got 500 people in your audit auditorium because Warner Hotels are, are, are very different um, in terms of hotel chain because they have super high quality auditoriums. They are amazing, amazing venues. So you've got 500 people there. Let's put on an opening act. Someone new that's emerging, that maybe has got a new album coming out and is putting a tour together. So then you've got 20 dates with a bedroom that's, that helps an artist start to put a tour together. This is only happening in England. So there is an opportunity to then move across the border and try and find um, hotel uh, hotels, individual hotels or a chain um, in Scotland that could add into that. So I think it's a big opportunity. I trialed the music hotel brand um, as part of my PhD research and I took 250 of my vinyl albums to the local hotel every Friday night uh, with a record player and just put the spotlight on the record player, put all the records into, into boxes and said, right, go for it. Browse through. It was like DIY vinyl night, so they were browsing through, and then they could go and put a record on the record player. And I cannot tell you how popular that was because they were browsing through, and it's like, oh my God, Mary, Mary, look, do you remember this one? Do you remember this? I bought that in Woolworths. It was two ninety nine, um, and all these memories were coming out, you know, about uh, oh God, oh, oh this. Uh, this I can't listen to this album anymore. Broke my heart. Don't tell the wife. Don't tell her. I had a I had an affair. I had an affair. Oh God, it was disastrous. I'm like, what? Your wife's sitting over there. Yeah, don't tell the wife. Don't tell the wife. Oh, okay. So, you know, th it really is the soundtrack to people's lives. And b putting putting a record on the on the uh, on the record player because a lot of people lost their vinyl collections in their divorce uh, or had a a random mad moment and decided to have a clear out and sent it all to the car boot sale and now really regret losing their vinyl collection. Um, just putting a record on a record player was like this sort of biblical religious experience 
Um, and for some of the, because uh, this was a multi-generational um, audience, some of the children or the grandchildren had never touched a record. And that was fascinating. Because they were, you had to teach them how to put the record onto the record player and then put the, put the you know, no, don't touch it like that, you touch it like this. Put it down, no, don't do it, you'd lose, use the lever at the side, use the lever. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but they loved it, you know, and there's something special about that sort of vinyl experience when you're, when you're sitting there just like watching it. Because it, it was the star of the show, which is why we put the spotlight on it. Um, because it, there's something really cool about seeing a record going around on a, on a turntable. So um, there are, I think, wh what I wanted to really try and instill in this, uh, in this presentation is the fact that it's just about getting creative and coming up with ideas because there is a very, very big uh, market opportunity out there. And it's about thinking creatively, thinking, right, what, what sort of experiences? Because people are, you know, they're really looking for experiences now because our houses are full. We're full of stuff. We don't need any more stuff. Because for most people, they've got too much stuff already. If you open any kitchen cupboard or anything, it's like, oh, comes crashing out. And a lot of people, they're, they're also storing their kids' stuff as well. And that's why the rise in storage units, that's the big industry to get into at the moment. It's like everyone's paying to put stuff in a storage unit because their houses are full. So they don't need any more stuff. They want experiences. And that's what we can give them using music. So um, it's just about this, really, is my last slide. It's about uh, we, we are talking about the creative industries, and it's about creative thinking. And a lot of the examples that you heard this morning were amazing examples of creative thinking. It's about, right, we think that there's a market for this, and so we'll come up with this really cool concept that's got a music theme, and we'll find the market, and we'll promote it to the market. You know, there is a market there. so. You're just missing an opportunity if you don't put together a strategy and experiences and packages that tap into that existing marketplace. So um, I don't know if we want to do some questions. Has anyone got any got any questions, or are you in that sort of? Oh, I had too many bread rolls. Um, well, I went to them, sorry, I had to go and get my beer. Um, <laughs> it is a music event after all. Uh, I, I went to them and they, they spend uh, six million pounds a year on music entertainment. So they, they already had uh, a background in music, but it was, we're going to do 60s nights. Um, or we're going to do 70s disco nights, or and they, they'd been doing a lot of that sort of <laughs> repetitive stuff, which when they started doing it, it was hugely successful, hugely successful, which is why they've built this super loyal database. But now it's a bit cheesy, and it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, the new audience that they need to win doesn't identify with the cheesy 60 night or the 70s night or it's about authenticity which is what we were looking at earlier and it's like how, how can we add something to that 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 is you know slightly different angle that may be you know a bit more intellectual with a talk or something around the literary side of it or the photography side of it to make it a bit different because pubs and clubs and hotels all over the UK are now doing 60s nights with tribute bands it's not special. So, so in terms of being forward thinking, Born Leisure, already, they already were, because they'd seen the power of music and how much, because um, Born Leisure, which they own uh, Warner Hotels, they also own Butlins. So they were doing the 80s nights, and now they're doing the 90s nights with the, I think the Happy Mondays did the Butlin, the Butlins recently. It's like, they sell out. They sell out. My sister went to the 80s one. She's like, oh my God, it's the best weekend I've ever had in my life. Like, really? 
Yeah, and that's that's what you know. When when you watched um, Jens video there where that guy was like, oh, I'm going to go on the next one, I'm going to go on the next one, I'm going to go on the next one. It's like, when, it's like going on tour, you know, it's a real s special bonding experience that people go away and talk about. And from a marketing point of view, if I was looking at, uh, if I was a marketing direction director looking at how to spend my marketing budget, word of mouth marketing is my favourite, favourite thing. You want people going away and going, oh my God, I've just had the most amazing weekend. And with Warners, they book the following year before they leave the hotel sometimes, which is why we're, we're booking 2018 now, because we had to book 2017 uh, nine months ago, so that when the people are in the hotel, they know what's happening um, the, the following year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm staying around all day and all night, so. Can you just repeat it into the mic? Yeah, certainly. Um, it was, you know, talking about, you know, Radio 2 and, and the demographic, but if you listen to something like BBC Six Music and listen to who's actually, you know, phoning in, it's all guys like me. <laughs> you know, that are listening to BBC Six Music, you know, so, so uh, you know, there is this huge appetite for new stuff. Now, okay, if I go to my vinyl collection, most of which I trashed in car boot sales and whatever, <laughs> and now regret deeply, but, you know, I mean, I'm not rebuying that stuff. I'm, it's new stuff I'm buying because I'm wanting to hear new things in my ears. So, so it is about just thinking that wee bit more f forward thinking. You know, we almost lost six music, and um, w w you know when we were saying about the the new fifty year old not identifying with Saga and things like that, the the, the audience of six music, the average listener age is forty five. So, and even Radio One, the average age is thirty four. You know, there's certain stuff on there that I'm still listening to because it's exactly the same as the stuff I was DJing in the nineties. And on that note. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia. Fantastic. And, um, Julia's around all evening as well, so grab her for a beer.